We're gonna get into one of my favorite segments. It's we've decided to call it Learn Burn, uh, and Amir is gonna be teaching us some things that he's learned this week. So Amir, take it away. All right. So if you guys know me at all, you know I'm kind of obsessed with World War One. Anyway, yeah. This is a little interesting thing that like I kind of learned about in the past couple of weeks, but it's called the Iron Harvest. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, Grace, if you've ever heard of this because you're from that part of the world. But the <laughs> Iron Har <laughs> the Iron Harvest refers to it's the annual harvest of unexploded ordnance, barbed wire, shrapnel, bullets, and congruent trench support collected by Belgian and French farmers after plowing their fields. Oh, that's yeah, I do actually. Is this know what about you this? did when you were younger? No, but I do know about this. <laughs> yeah, and it sounds dangerous. So in World War One, like almost one ton of explosives was fired for every square meter of territory on the oh Western Front. Oh my gosh, Front. that's crazy. So there is so much unexploded ordnance that's just buried in the ground, mm -hmm. and over time it kind of raises up. So unexploded ordnance and all these things are constantly being dug up by people, and actually a lot of people have died since this happened. Um, they've they've recovered about 900 tons of unexploded munitions every year, oh my and gosh. since 1945, approximately 630 French clears have died handling these munitions. That's insane. That's I, crazy. I will say that growing up, I grew up in Waterloo, Belgium, and so mm -hmm. there was a, Belgium was absolutely destroyed. Um, and yeah. the, the Nazis just came straight through. Well, that was World War II, but like it was the not, German Empire. Yeah. yeah, not a good time. And uh, I grew up on my street. There was a, I think it's called like a pillbox. Is that mm -hmm. correct? There yeah. was a pillbox at like my corner. There was like a Colroy, and then there would be like a pillbox. You could just go in and like explore, and like people would go there to smoke and stuff. And there was like graffiti. And you grew up with a lot of. Um, these relics and reminders wow. of the war. And one of our like field trips was going to, it wasn't a, a concentration camp, but it was a transportation camp that was stationed in Belgium. Mm. And um, so you, I, I was maybe nine. And then they take you to Flanders as well, and you mm -hmm. learn the poem in Flanders Fields, the poppies grow between the crosses row on row. And like that's the sort of history lessons where that, that I was getting growing up. And I understand that when you're raised in the United States, it's all about American history. And I do feel like growing up overseas, I have far more of a global understanding of history. Like I understand yeah. the United States' impact on the war as well, but I also understand um, how the war uh, began and like what and what it left behind and the, the ruins that it left. So that is interesting because I didn't think I would know about the iron harvest and I've never heard it called that before, but I definitely <laughs> Uh, know about it actually. Yeah, just it's, from it just there. it blows my mind thinking that this thing that happened that long ago. There's just millions upon millions of unexploded shells, mustard gas mm -hmm. canisters that are just buried in the ground waiting to come up. So anyway, that's crazy. Um, moving on, com something completely different. <laughs> this this woman named Joy Milne from the UK. She has the ability to smell Parkinson's disease. This is crazy. I know it's it's <laughs> such a crazy story. So her husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And she noticed that he started smelling different about six years before he passed away, unfortunately, from the disease. And she said his smell changed and it seemed difficult to describe. It wasn't all of a sudden, it was very subtle, a musky smell. Huh. So after her husband passed away, she joined a charity for Parkinson's in the UK and she realized that she can smell that same smell on a lot of different people. When it's coming on or when they already have? When they when they already have it. Okay. So as soon as like they start getting Parkinson's, she can smell this. So she teamed up with some scientists and they actually did a study and they found that she got six out of the seven participants in the study, she nailed it. Like they all had yeah. Parkinson's and she got wow. it. Wow. She had another one too, but he was in the control group. So they were like, no, he doesn't have Parkinson's. Eight months later, they find out that he does have Parkinson's. So she actually got like seven out of seven. Whoa. Right. That's so crazy. I, I sort of thought that it was gonna be fake when yeah. you hear the tease you hear of the, the story. Yeah, yeah, it's like she can smell people that already have Parkinson's. It's like, well, I can tell yeah. when it's already raining. So like, that's like, really incredible. Based off of this information, they're trying, like, they're trying to figure out like maybe we can create a test where you just swab someone's skin and you can find out that they have Parkinson's. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, that would be that would be a huge scientific huge. Yeah. advancement. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I thought that was really cool. Finally, tomatoes. Tomatoes. Yes. <laughs> tomatoes. I, I think I've talked to you about this, Grace, a few times, just because it's super fascinating to me. But like tomatoes are just like weird. And one thing that I didn't know about them is that they're natively from South America and they weren't cultivated like until like around 500 BC up to Mexico. And so basically Western European Western Europeaners didn't get to them until the 1500s. And when they did get them, they thought it was poisonous. Fair. And for about <laughs> <Very fair. laughs> 300 years, 
they just sat in Italy as ornamental fruits. They didn't oh, eat it wow. until like the late 1700s. That's amazing. So that was that was kind of like an interest. There's a lot more, but if, like, yeah. yeah. You know what? I wish that there were like little scenes like that in a period movie would just make me live. If it was like a little kid running up to be like, oh, don't touch that. It's a tomato. It's poisonous. Like that would be <laughs> just to date the, the, the movie. Yeah. Like little things like that or just, you know, how everyone smelled. And we'd never talk about that when yeah. you like look at old movies. I just, yeah. like we think of tomatoes like Italian foods, Spaghetti sauce, pizza sauce, but like for like 300 years they had it, and they were like, "We're not going to eat." You that. know, that was you just, do not eat that. Thing that was right just there. someone that like didn't like the taste of a tomato and was just like, "Oh, gross, poison." Someone in a, in a position of power was just like, <laughs> "Hell no, those things are." I don't crazy. like how they're categorized as fruit. It's very misleading. You think I it know. should be a vegetable? That's always, absolutely. I think that's like every fifth it's grader's so misleading. Fun fact. Do you think that's because though we eat it like a vegetable, we don't eat it like a fruit? Yeah, for sure. If the context change at the end, yeah. There's no way to eat it like a fruit. It, it, the way a fruit is a I've fruit. I've seen people yeah. bite out of a tomato, and I'm like, you are a psychopath. We cannot that is ever weird. cross like, paths again. Eat onions a like that fruit too. is a fruit if you can put some sugar, some powdered sugar on it, and call it a dessert. You cannot do that with a tomato. No. Therefore, it is a fake fruit. <laughs> it is a fraud.